I'm Jeff Cook, and this is Backyard Basics. I hope last month y'all had a, y'all enjoyed the show with the Wainwrights and got to see a little bit more about the peach uh, industry, about the peach packing business, about growing a peach and getting it from you know to the from the field to you, or getting it to the grocery store. Um, this month, I started think I was trying to think about what to do. I had some suggestions from people, and I thought, you know, I always take for granted that everybody that's in Taylor County, in Middle Georgia, or in Georgia, you know, riding through riding past fields, riding out in the you know country, I always just take a, take for granted that they know what they're seeing. That you know they ride by a field and they know what it is. I mean, I've got a three-year-old and a ten-year-old, so I get questions all the time. Daddy, what's that? Daddy, what's that? Why? Are, what's this? Why is that over there? So I thought, well, and I've done this show before, something like this before, but I thought let's we're gonna walk, we're gonna ride around Taylor County, Middle Georgia area. Um, Go in some grow, grow in some row crop fields. Maybe you look at some pecans. Uh, just go in some different things. Just look at some of the different commodities that are growing right now. Um, maybe talk a little bit about them. Explain a little bit about them for some of those of y'all that may not be from around here, or some of y'all that may you know don't have any kind of farming background or agriculture background. Maybe it'll kind of answer a few questions of you know what are those white and pink flowers you see out in this big green field, or or where does a peanut come from, or you know, what is that growing in that field? So hopefully, you know, answer a few questions, tell you a little bit about some of the crops we grow in, the, in Taylor County, and uh, maybe give you a little bit of education, maybe let your kids watch this and, you know, it'll answer some of the questions that they might, ask, might be asking you while they're riding down the road. All right, so we're gonna start off with a crop that's near and dear to a lot of farmers' hearts in Georgia. Uh, it's one of the top commodities we grow in the state, and it's cotton. So if you're driving by a field these days, a, a big green field right now, and you've got white and pink flowers you've seen out there, um, that's a cotton field. Um, as you can see, cotton is actually a perennial plant. It's actually more of a tree than, a, than an annual crop like you would think most of our, our crops are, that we grow here. You know, soybeans, things like that, corn. Those are annual, uh, annual plants. They grow, they produce, a, a, you know, they produce a flower, produce seed, they die. Cotton is actually a perennial, so it's trying to grow, it's trying to keep growing, it wants to be a tree. They'll get really woody, they'll get like a tree, uh, they come back next year if it didn't get so cold in Georgia. Um, one thing that's interesting about cotton, you can see in this plant right here, you'll have what starts off, you'll have a first flower you get, it's going to be a white flower. This white flower on day two is going to turn pink, um, which is another reason why that plant that a lot of people plant in their yard, a Confederate rose, some people call it a cotton rose, has white flower than a pink flower. Once you've got that pink flower, um, it's going to fall off and behind, left behind under that pink flower, you may be able to see right here, is a small, what we, what we call a bowl. Um, this bowl will grow, mature, enlarge, and eventually you'll end up with this right here. And inside of this right here, you get the cotton plant, and once this pops open, once this opens up, attached to those seed um, is what we call lint. It's the cotton lint, and that's what we use to make your underwear, your socks, your jeans, um, you can actually crack this one open. It's not a mature bowl yet, but when you crack it open, um, and I know everybody around here has seen these fields when they pop open, um, that is the actual cotton that's attached to a seed. Um, so just a little bit, little quick, quick little story about cotton. You know, if you're driving by a cotton field, you can kind of explain to people what you're seeing there. And I'll, I'll point this out real, real, real quick too. Because we've all got to throw a little humor in on the show, right? Um, this is a fairly new disease that we've been seeing on cotton in the last few years, battling, you know, Roundup resistant pigweed. We're having to use a lot of more powerful herbicides to try and combat it. This is what we call Paraquatus spoticus. Um, it's a really devastating disease, uh, usually caused by drift from a little bit of herbicide. Um, this won't, this won't kill the plant, but it just makes it look a little bit ugly for a while. Um, all right, well, we're going to move on. We're going uh, to go hit on a, maybe, maybe you can look at a soybean field and go uh, dispel a myth that, that deer are not bad in Georgia. All right, so we're in a normal soybean field that has not been eaten up by uh, deer. There's always going to be some deer damage, but they haven't, they have not totally destroyed this field. Uh, like I said, soybeans are going to be an uh, annual crop um, and an annual plant. So these things, once they once they kind of bloom out of the top, and these are the really in, inconspicuous blooms. You know, if you're riding a field, down down the highway or down the, you know even a dirt road, you're not going to see the flowers of a soybean plant. But these flowers will eventually turn into pods, which will eventually have you know two to three soybeans. Um, 
So these things will probably get a few more, maybe about another foot tall on them uh, before they finish growing and then they really get into the reproductive stage. Um, I don't know if any of y'all dealt with kudzu bugs in your homes or on your vegetable gardens, but kudzu bugs were a real problem a few years back on soybeans. Um, you don't really see kudzu, you'll see kudzu bugs every once in a while now, um, but we don't see them to the levels they were. Uh, actually, when the, when the kudzu bug hitchhiked over here, you know, probably on a container ship, I guess probably in 2009, it brought with it a parasitic wasp. That wasp actually does nothing but go and sting all the eggs of the, the, uh, the kudzu bug. So when you find kudzu bug eggs places, most of the time those eggs have actually been stung by uh, the wasp. The developing wasp basically, as it, as it hatches out and becomes a small larvae, it feeds on the, the kudzu bug egg and emerges out of that egg case. Uh, pretty neat little thing if you ever get to see it. They're pretty t tiny, so you may never see it, but you know, soybeans, if you're driving down the, down, the, down the road, you see this big open field of some tall plants that are dark green, that's usually soybeans. Uh, we grow a pretty good number of soybeans in you know, middle Georgia area, and a lot of the soybeans get planted behind wheat. So we saw a, normally, you know, a normal soybean field earlier. This is um, some of Jeff Wainwright's soybeans. You can tell they're considerably taller than that last field we're in. Um, don't know what he does, but they're always a good bit taller than the rest. Behind me is a soybean field that has been decimated by deer. Um, we just got rain the other day, so you can't see all the deer tracks, or I would kind of point them out. But this right here, you can see in front of me, um, nothing but stems here. Stems there, it looks like probably if you plant a peas in your garden sometimes, it looks about like that. Um, this plant has made it, but it had the main stem chewed off um, and it's sprouted from below, below there. It's trying to grow some more. Um, and it's even had some of those leaves that have sprouted and since sprouted the new leaves. Um, they've been chewed off, chewed off by deer. So you can see all this new growth, all this new growth is coming from, um, coming from the, the, basically the point where the deer have chewed it off. So, uh, for those that say we don't have enough deer in Georgia, I think the grower that planted this field would say, you know, we got plenty of deer. Um, so make sure you uh, fill, your, fill your bag limit on, on does this year. <laughs> and it fields of corn in Taylor County right now, but uh, this one was close. Um, and I just thought I'd point out a few things about corn. We don't grow a lot of dry land corn because if you've grown corn, uh, without irrigation, you know that it can be a disaster. Uh, corn varieties these days, um, they have the genetic potential to produce over three, 400 bushels of corn. Um, but with a dry land field, you know, if you don't get rains at the right time, we can easily make <laughs> 35 bushels. So if you put all the money into the seed, the fertilizer, um, weed control, and you make 35 bushels of corn, especially at $4 corn, you're not making much any money on a you're actually losing a bunch of money on an acre of uh, land. Uh, that's why we don't grow a lot of dry land corn. This is a fairly good uh, dry land crop. Got planted really early, caught some rains, and ended up being really good. Something about corn, though, maybe a lot of people don't understand. First off, the ear in this corn plant was formed when that plant was about knee high. Eight, when it has about eight leaves on it, the, the ear is starting to form. So the rows around that kernel and the, the, the length of that kernel, or the length of that cob, uh, the corn ear is being de being developed. So any kind of stress at that point has a lot lot to do with what sh you know what ends up under this husk at the end of the season. Um, another thing that we help we help growers determine you know we look at diseases and insects, but we also help them determine when the best time to quit irrigating. Like I said, this is not an irrigated field, but if it was, um, the last stage of, of reproduction in a corn uh, in the ear is when these kernels are filling out. They go from a milky substance inside which is what a lot of people would harvest as a, a roasting ear. You know, it's real milky, it's real juicy, it's still pretty sweet. Once those, those sugars start turning to starch, um, you start going to the dough stage, which is when this kernel starts getting hard, and it gets hard from the outside down to the cob. Um, but what we do is we help farmers determine when they can turn the water off. Um, I was out in the field the other day. Uh, the corn didn't look quite this dry down, but it was starting to dry down, but the corn was still still had a little bit to go before it was actually physically or uh, physio physio physiologically mature. So, you know, the last few, the last few weeks, last say two weeks of this, the, the life of this um, ear and these kernels, um, they put on a good bit of dry matter, a good bit of kernel weight, and what that turns into in the end is it turns into a good bit of yield. And what you can see, maybe if we can zoom in, is 
you know, of course this stuff is mature, it's drying down, it's dented, uh, it's really dry, but when these kernels get dry and we, they get mature, when they're, when they're finally at their final stage, there's a black layer that forms at the base of this kernel. It's called the black layer, very uh, creative. And once that black layer forms, um, that's when we know we can turn the water off. There's no more, there's no more water going to this kernel. It's com completely mature and it's gonna start drying down. Um, so that's your basic um, you know, corn 101 and irrigation uh, lesson for today. All right, hopefully everybody knows what we're standing in right here. I mean, I think everybody knows this is grass that will be cut for hay. Um, this is actually some Tift 85, which is the highest quality Bermuda grass we really have in, you know, in Georgia. It's bred uh, by, it was created by breeders at UGA. Um, but I just, I, mean, I wanted to mention this because we are seeing a lot of army worms. I didn't find any in this field. We are seeing a lot of army worms and the Bermuda grass stem maggots. So if you've got hay fields out there um, and you don't read the newspaper, I put an article in there, but you know, protect your investment. You know, be out there looking for army worms. Be out there looking for damage from the stem maggot. Hopefully, later on, we're gonna find some, you know, some some damage from some stem maggots and maybe find some army worms. But just be on the lookout. Be you know, be in the fields. Be looking, and uh, you know, spray as needed. Um, but you know, we'll uh, we'll find some. And all right, so I can't be in Georgia, be a Georgia county agent, and not talk about peanuts. Um, I know I'm not exactly correct, but in Georgia we grow anywhere from 500,000 to 750,000 acres of peanuts. Um, it is a major crop in a lot of counties, especially southwest of us. You know, some of these counties that have 30 plus thousand acres and more of peanuts in the, in the, in the county alone. Um, we don't grow that many up here, but it is a very important crop to a lot of our growers. Um, and there's still a lot of people out there, a lot of people in Georgia that don't know, you know where a peanut grows. You know, I hear people talk about, you know, peanut trees and especially little kids, they don't, they've never seen a peanut, no, never seen where it grows. So this is a peanut plant. Obviously, you don't see any flowers up here on top. You really have to kind of get down into it and look and see, and I don't even see any flowers down in here. Down in here. Um, because all the flowers have already kind of fallen off. But what you'll see is here's where your peanuts grow. So I have to come out here and invert these things. But what peanut, what a peanut does, is it will produce a flower. And there was a flower right here. I'll find a flower in a minute. There was a flower right here. Once that flower is pollinated, then it forms this peg. This peg starts growing down into the ground. That peg gets down into the ground, then you get the start of a peanut. Um, so that's the start of your peanut. That's a little bit bigger, and these are as they're getting closer to maturity. Uh, most peanuts will take about uh, 140 days for a, from the time you plant to the time that they're they're fully mature, and for you to get all you know for you to get you know harvestable peanuts. Here's a flower right here. Let's see if I can pull this thing out here. So that's your flower. That's your peanut flower. Uh, once that flower is pollinated, then the peg will form, and it'll start growing down into the ground. Um, you can kind of see on some of these plants um, some burning on the leaves some yellowing in the fields. Uh, that burning right there in yellowing is called, caused by a potato leaf hopper. Just a little side note for you, if you care. Um, it's a little tiny insect, doesn't do a lot of damage other than just making the fields look a little yellow um, and aggravating farmers. They, you know, they want a pretty green field of peanuts. They don't want a little you know, yellow patches out there, yellow streaks out there. So these are peanuts. All right, so we're in a, sor a grain sorghum field or a milo field. Um, this is probably one of the last uh, row crops or field crops you know that we, we actually have this year in Taylor County. A lot of years we'll have some sesame and we do have some sesame on the south end of the county um, this year and then we'll also have sunflowers but uh, sunflower prices are kind of we, don't, we probably won't see any sunflowers this year. Uh, but grain sorghum is grown for grain. Um, some people grow up for bird fields but one, one thing it has uh, these days is it has a real serious aphid pest. It's called a sugarcane aphid. It used to only be a pest of sugar canes and now sugar cane and now it's moved over and it'll actually feed on grain sorghum. Um, they fly in and start reproducing and they can get pretty heavy. A couple weeks ago this field um, pretty much was just was shiny with honeydew produced by the aphids and uh, and uh, this farmer came in last week into this or first of this week sprayed and controlled them really well. Our, earlier last week when we were coming out here looking this whole leaf would have been covered up with aphids and they not only reduce your test weight or your yield if you let them go uh, but they also they produce so much honeydew and so much sugar and it, these, this field gets so sticky when you put a combine in here you actually can't make it you know through a few times without having to get out uh, clean the combine out and clean all that gum and all that sugar out. 
Um, so that's something to look for. If you do have grain sorghum planted for a bird field, you, know, you might want to go look. Um, I mentioned army worms in our hay fields, which I've been getting reports about army worms in hay fields. So if you've got brown type millet planted for a bird field, you know, you might want to look at that also. And if you've got that kind of grass planted, um, you know, in a, say as a, as a summer forage for your, you know, your cattle or goats or whatever, you know, definitely be looking for that, those pests. Uh, be looking in all your fields for, for insect pests. They seem to be really bad this year. Um, we've seen anywhere, you know, we've seen spider mites, stink bugs, uh, squash bugs, um, you know, all over the place. So, you know, be, be on the lookout for these insect pests. Diseases are out there too. So, you know, just be diligent, be looking, be in your fields, be in your garden, be in your yards, um, even your food plots, you know, be looking because things can be out there, things are out there that are looking to destroy them. Not that they're being mean, that's just what they do. All right, one other crop that we grow here in Taylor County, um, a few hundred acres of them, is uh, watermelons. Another favorite, you know, Georgia crop. I know one that everybody loves. Even though these are seedless, you know, you don't have anything to spit out in your backyard. You know, it's kind of sad that we don't have, you know, as many seeded watermelons anymore. But still, it's a pretty important crop in Taylor County. They're actually out here harvesting right now. They've already come through here, so some of these are still immature. They're still growing. But one thing I wanted to show you here, because it's been really bad this year, is I was going to show you a squash bug. Um, not, not so much damage, because you don't really see the damage out here, because it takes a lot of them to damage a watermelon crop. But kind of show you what to look for and what, you know, I'm sure if you have squash, cucumbers, anything like that, you probably saw it in your garden this year. But these are the squash bug eggs. You know, they lay them on top of the leaf in clusters. These have not hatched out yet. Um, three of them maybe have, but the majority of them have not hatched out yet. Um, but if you really have a bad problem, and there's a bad problem in this small corner of this field, um, you will see the eggs and that adult one just jumped off the leaf. You'll find the adults. This is actually a female adult, and they, if you can kind of see, same shape as a stink bug. They are a type of stink bug. They will stink. Uh, a lot of times you see two of these stuck together, rear to rear, doing a little dance. You see that dance before you see the eggs. That's all I'm gonna say about that. And then, when you know that they're really bad is when you start finding the immatures. Um, and I will find, I think, an immature over here somewhere. You can see down in here, the immature squash bugs. Um, they're down here in the crown of the plant, and they're doing a lot of damage by feeding. They feed by piercing the vine. Uh, they inject enzymes that actually damage the vine. Um, so that, those have been really, really bad this year. You know, over here, you got, you know, you got immatures on top of eggs. So when you start seeing that kind of, that kind of infestation, it's uh, time to, pull out an insecticide and uh, spray. And it's always good when spraying insects um, on a crop that's blooming like this to do it late in the evening when it's, or in the afternoon when it's hot, uh, make sure the bees are not out foraging. A lot of times bees will forage early in the morning when it's cool and they'll quit, they'll quit foraging uh, later in the afternoon when it gets really, really hot. And that's a good time to apply pesticides if you have to do it. Um, and if you can, by all means, you know, remove the hive while you're spraying. I know it's probably repet repetitive for a lot of y'all that actually get out and see all this stuff, but maybe some of y'all that don't, you know, that aren't from the country, uh, aren't from here, or that just didn't really have an idea what was growing out in these fields. Maybe you learned a little bit today. Maybe you can share it with your grandkids or your kids. Uh, maybe, some, you know, maybe some of the school kids in Taylor County will get a little bit out of this. So they'll know what's growing in the fields around their houses or, you know, next to the school or on the Taylor County or the Peach County Extension Office, you know, with ideas or comments. Uh, my email address is on the screen. You know, email me with questions or comments, um, suggestions for shows. Um, this is back, my name is Jeff Cook again. This is Backyard Basics, where we're filmed in your backyard.